Welcome to Copy Traders Club, where you can learn how to make more money copy trading. I'm Gavin McCauley, my name and username on eToro. You can continue the conversation on Discord and Facebook. If you like this podcast and want to see it continue, you can do your part by recommending it to one person or group of people this week. Today is a chat with a PI with a long history of fantastic results but whose present is providing a bit of a challenge. Here we go. Episode 30 of Copy Traders Club, and we are being visited here at the clubhouse by none other than Harry Harrison, a.k.a. Harry Hitch, 1993, a PI who has been on the platform since 2016. He's out of the limousine, and, mercifully for you, listener, he's an English speaker. So no tortured welcome in a hastily prepared foreign tongue. Harry, hello. Welcome to Copy Traders Club. Hi. Hi, Gavin. How are you? (laughs) Very well. And it's great to have you here. As you may know, in order to get past reception, you have to answer a series of quickfire questions. Are you ready for those? Yep. Username on eToro. Harry H. 1993. Date you joined eToro. 23rd of December 2016. Year of birth. 1993. Place of residence. London. Profession. Uh, Full-time eToro popular investor. Briefly state what you aim to achieve on eToro. Outperform the S and P five hundred over five year periods. Name one of your investing heroes. Peter Lynch. Name one of your favorite investing books. The Psychology of Money. That completes the formalities. Let's proceed now into our VIP section here at the clubhouse, the magnificent Copy Traders Lounge. Harry Harrison, aka Harry H, nineteen ninety three. Are you ready for this magical transition? As ready as I'll ever be. Let's go. So Harry, here we are now in the amazing Copy Traders Lounge. You strike me as a very laid back chap, but surely even you're heart is going pitter-patter to be in such magnificent surroundings. Yeah, I'm pretty nervous. It's a very grand (laughs) building you've got. Well, we were postponed slightly in getting you here because you were in Mexico. How was that? Yeah, it was pretty good. Uh, I just went there to see a friend, stayed with them for a bit. Didn't get a chance to travel much around, which I'd like to one day, but nice weather, nice food. Cheaper than London. What part of Mexico were you in? Uh, it's called Cuernavaca. It's like an hour and a half south of Mexico City. Mountain town? Nah, not really. It's pretty flat. Big valley through the middle. Yeah, it's a pretty nice place. It's called like the spring of Mexico because the weather's meant to... I think it's the weather's meant to be some of the best in the world. So. And uh, what's the coronavirus situation there? Getting worse. I got back like the day before it went on the red list, which was kind of lucky, but they're not, they're pretty laid back about it. They don't, there's no restrictions. They let anyone into the country, but I think cases are going up like South America and Latin America are much more laid back about it than we are in Europe, but then they haven't got the same vaccination rates or anything. All right. So Harry Harrison, that's a fun name. What kind of Mr. and Mrs. Harrison would choose to name their son Harry? I don't know. It just I think my granddad was called Harry, so they kind of took it off him, and then the Harrison was my dad's name. So Your grandfather and your mum's side? Yeah, yeah, he was called Harry, so I was named after him. And then my dad's family are called Harrison, so the two kind of crossed each other. Well, it reminds me of Magnus Magnuson. Do you know who that is? No. He was a famous TV presenter from Iceland who presented the UK quiz show Mastermind for like 25 oh, right. years. Oh, well. And 
His fir- his first name is in fact Magnus Sigursteinson, and he changed right. his name when the family moved to Scotland, and they adopted the British naming convention over the Icelandic. Do you know about the Icelandic naming convention? No. If your dad is called Sigmund, your surname is Sigmundson. Ah, okay, so they just add Sun on to the end. Ah, that's the same as the Harrison is the origin. It's the same kind of thing. <laughs> kind of. But if you're a female and you're a daughter of Sigmund, your surname is Sigmund's daughter. Ah, right, okay. Your brothers and sisters have different surnames. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well. Yeah, that is pretty weird. I ask who would give a child a name like that, but the answer seems to be loads of people, as I've discovered in my research. There's a lot of Harry Harrisons out there. (laughs) Exactly, when you search on Facebook, it's loads. So, are you ever confused with Harry Harrison, former big cheese at Barclays Capital, whose name was often mentioned in the LIBOR scandal? No, never being confused with him. Are you ever confused with Harry Harrison, American science fiction author, known mostly for his character, the stainless steel rat. No. (laughs) Good character, though. (laughs) Sounds good. Uh, I should probably link to that in the show notes for anyone who wants further information on the stainless steel rat. (laughs) Well, your fact sheet called you Harry Stefan Harrison. Yeah, I don't know why. And says you're from the Isle of Man. Are you from the Isle of Man? Yeah, I am. Yeah, yeah. I'm not called Stefan, though. Born and bred? Yeah, I lived there until I was 20. I've got a friend who lives in a place called Island McGee in Northern Ireland. And you can see the Isle of Man from his garden. Yeah, some days on the Isle of Man, you can see, you can see like Scotland, Ireland, England, Wales. If, on a good day. Because it's right in the centre. I thought maybe it said Isle of Man because you were some sort of tax pimpernel and you were banking there. Ah, no, 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 no. I was <laughs> genuinely from there. That would It would have been handy, though, to stay there from a tax point of view, but London's more fun. <laughs> and so let's talk about the Isle of Man. Many people mightn't have heard of it, our international listeners. It's a little island in between Ireland and the island of Britain. Yeah, yeah. And I recall they were worried once about gay rights affecting the tourism potential of the Isle of Man. They thought they were going to be inundated with lots of gay holidaymakers because it's called the Isle of Man. Oh, I see. Uh And it also dawned on me that if you say it in a slightly different way, it sounds like I love man. Ah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Have you ever been troubled by th- thoughts such as these? And how the how the name Isle of Man? No, <laughs> it's never really crossed my mind. I suppose when I've grown up with it, you just kind of get used to it, and I never really thought about it. It's like my name. I never realised that was weird until I left school and met other people. Well, I'm sorry to be dragging up those old emotions. It's all right. Well, the reason I'm going off on more tangents than normal, Harry, is because I found very little information on you, and I couldn't really formulate too many questions. So why don't you tell us things people don't know about you and can't know about you from reading your eToro profile? We'll settle for one or two. I spent four years traveling around Australia and Southeast Asia. Very good. Where did you go? And Europe. Uh, well, Australia, obviously. Uh, South, a lot of countries in Southeast Asia, India, Israel, and then a lot of countries in Europe. Four years uh, in a row? Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's a lot. Uh, yeah. I was wor- I stayed in Australia for two years of that, and I was like working there and saving money and traveling a bit, and then spent two years traveling around India, Southeast Asia, Europe. Four years is a long time to be traveling. Yeah, yeah, I suppose. Pretty good, though. <laughs> Doesn't seem that long when you're doing it. You're living in London now and full-time on eToro? Yeah, yeah. How did I come across you? I think the answer is, as it often is, Felix Felix review. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah. They're pretty good as videos, aren't they? Yeah. Do you know him quite well? He seems... I think... Have you spoken to him before? I've spoken to him before, yeah, yeah. I think on uh, Messenger or something. We spoke for a bit. 
And I've commented on a lot of his videos, and he's replied, and we've had like talks and comment threads and that. But I've never met him in person or anything. But he seems like a cool guy. Okay, let's have a question from the Art of People. Can you pick a number between 1 and 10? 7. If you weren't doing what you're doing today, what would you be doing and why? Uh, I'd be working in like programming or software or something. Because that's originally what I wanted to do before I became a popular investor. That's why I'd be doing that, probably. Just because I enjoy it and it's I find it quite interesting. You can learn a lot. Lots of jobs, useful, lots of reasons, really. Harry, at this stage of the game, I'd like to ask you to read your bio for the listener, please. About me, I've been interested in investing in business my whole life. I originally joined eToro to invest my own money and then discovered that through being a popular investor, I can earn money for others as well as myself. I'm now a full-time PI, so I can dedicate my time to finding promising companies and trying to earn money for me and my copiers. The portfolio is focused mainly on tech and energy stocks. However, I also invest in other businesses to diversify the portfolio if they have good growth potential and are well-managed. I aim to hold all our investments for a minimum period of three years, but prefer to hold them for longer. Copy for the long term and ensure you're able to ignore short term volatility. There's no specific copy amount, even $200 will be enough to copy all open trades. But obviously, more will provide larger returns. Some nice marketing there. I can earn money for others as well as myself, you say. And you also say, I aim to hold all our investments for a minimum period of three years. Ah, oh, yeah, it's just. Yeah, common sense, isn't it? Refer to the collective rather than yourself and stuff like that. Well, that's nice that that's your automatic approach, is to think of it as our money. Think of your copiers. Yeah, well, I think you've kind of got to as well. Like, it's quite a lot of other people's money. Probably more money than I'm ever going to have in my life is what I'm managing now. So got to think of other people. Okay, so you say for three years... Let's talk about being a long-term value investor on eToro. I talked to Heloise about this last week. So let me ask you, as a popular investor on eToro who invests for the long term, what must you do that you wouldn't do if you were simply investing for yourself? Yeah, you've got to try and keep the uh, value invested in value columns. Roughly the same because if they're not, then change in the value of one stock in your portfolio can have a much bigger or smaller change in the value in the copiers' portfolio. So how do you do that? You have to then trim positions that you would otherwise let run. Yeah, you just have to sell it when it gets to us. Like I sell mine when they get to eighty percent, and then reinvest them. But you just have to sell them at some point. And then, and then buy again if you're still keen. And then buy it again, yeah. Well, you don't have to, but if you don't... Like, I didn't used to do that. I had a lot of positions that were like at 1,000% or 600%, and it looks really good in your portfolio. But then your performance is completely different to your copy's performance because like the allocations are just so different between what you have and what they have. Yeah, and not only would that put new copiers off, but it can also create confusion and kind of annoyance because copiers are like, how come you've made so much and I've only made a pittance? There was a, you had Victor, Victor Zhang, as he called. Mm -hmm. You had him on. He was the one that told me because I was getting like bigger returns than him. And he asked me why. And I didn't know at the time. This was only this time last year, roughly. And I didn't know what the problem was at the time. But then he contacted eToro customer service and they told him that the copiers get the invested amount, whereas the PI has the value amount in their portfolio. Well, that's an absolutely fundamental thing for everyone to understand in the yeah. world of copy trading, isn't it? I wonder what proportion of copiers know that. I think a lot don't understand, don't know that. Because <laughs> I didn't, I'd been doing it for like eight months and I didn't even know. And I'd had eToro for four years at that point. So like, I didn't know. So I don't think a lot of people do know. But it's, it, yeah, it is super important. 
Okay, so as a long-term value investor, you do that in order to maintain sync both pre and during the copy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. My other question on that is, do you think another effect of doing that is that it pleases copiers because copiers like to see action? The reverse of that being, if you just bought and held and did nothing for five years, people would think you're doing nothing with their money? Possibly. Like a lot of it is just buying and doing nothing. <laughs> but yeah, people probably like to see that you're doing something just because it makes them feel better. That you haven't forgot about them or something. But really, I don't think it has. That's the, well, that's the feeling I get. Yeah, a lot of investing is buying and doing nothing yeah. if you're doing it for yourself. But as a popular investor, there are different factors at play. Yeah, I suppose you've got to look like you're doing something. Just but Then you really don't want to be. <laughs> Well, that's exactly what I saw copiers accusing a certain another PI of, who is a real buy and hold guy at heart. And if you buy something and you're gonna you're gonna hold your six positions for three years, and they go up and down with the vicissitudes of life, when they're down, copiers are like up in arms. I saw them writing on his feet, "What the hell are you doing? It seems like you're doing nothing." Yeah. Exactly, but I think you've just got to try and ignore it as much as you can, as best you can. Or explain, try and explain what's going on. Or explain it, yeah, yeah. But then a lot of times you explain it, they get back to you, they say this, someone else starts saying a different thing, and you just get drawn into the, an argument about what you're trying to do, whether it's the best thing, why you believe it's the best thing. Yeah, because I've had long-term investors who I propose eToro to, saying, I don't want to do it. The system and the people uh, all sort of encourage short-term behavior. I think a lot of it is because I, I suspect the company's probably incentivized to encourage short-term behavior because the more you, you get in and out of positions, the more they make on the spreads. So like if you're buying and holding it, you're not making much money for eToro, I suppose. Sure, but also if... You want copy trading to be a success. Everyone seems to be of the opinion that adopting a long-term mentality is the way to success. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's interesting because I've been trying to clarify in my own mind how a long-term investor can be faithful to their own investing principles and yet play the eToro game at the same time. Are there any other aspects to being a long-term investor that are in play other than those things we just mentioned? I think the whole idea of like, it's, it's kind of difficult to be a long-term investor on a social platform when every time it goes down 10%, you get people telling you to sell, you get a notification telling you it's down. People leaving comments saying, why did you invest in this? You're an idiot. So I think you kind of just got to try and ignore all that if you want to do it long-term. Yeah, that must be quite a challenge because the natural way to be an investor for you is kind of the coffee can approach, isn't it? Just buy it, put it away, let it play out, let it compound for years. Yeah, yeah. I just that's what that's what I did like every year and it's worked so far. Apart from this year. Well, we'll but come on to that later. The other four, it's worked fine. So I'll keep on doing it. It's the same kind of pressure that I've heard Phil Town talking about. It's like the institutional pressure of hedge fund managers, money managers generally, they're under pressure to perform quarter upon quarter. Yeah, so they, ca they can't have a long-term approach. Otherwise, their clients are going to go elsewhere. Yeah. So that's where we as retail investors have the edge, that we can just sit back and let it ride for yeah. three years. I think that's a big advantage as well that retail investors have over hedge funds and a lot of the more short-term things. As long as you can resist the, the pressures of... The social platform. Yeah, exactly. Interesting. What happened in the first week of April? Did you recycle all your positions? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. I added funds, so I had. There's a few ways to do that as well. But uh, how I did it was I closed everything, then added the funds, and then reinvested everything back in. Because I thought that's the best way to keep in sync with copiers and that. But there are always ways you can just add money proportionately. Yeah, yeah. Plus, if you do it on the first day of the month, it doesn't affect your stats, performance stats for the full month. Sure. 
So like if, you, if I did it on the 30th of April and I was down 10% and then I went and add, added some money, I'd be down like 5% or whatever, depending on how much I added. Surely no popular investor on eToro would dream of doing such a thing. Are you joke? I don't know if you're joking or not. <laughs> I'm joking. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I think so, there's a lot that do it. I don't know about a lot, but I, I've heard Andrew Haddon talk about two or three. That yeah. It's kind of... And the darker the star doesn't make it any less likely. Yeah, exactly. It's kind of, I think that should be like worked on because that's a pretty important point. If like if someone's copying you based on your prior performance and your prior performance is completely different to what it actually was, or it seems completely different. Like when you look on the stats page, it shows minus 1%, but even the month you were minus 10%. It's like... There are many similar... Issues with basing decisions on former performance stats. Because not just the adding of money, but the completely different investing approach, you know? Yeah, yeah. I kind of feel sorry for you in a way that you have to, you have to kind of standardize the, the stats page and a lot of the metrics and that. But then everyone's different in their approach. How often they add funds, how often they sell things. Yeah, it's not an easy job, but, you know, information is power. And if you want copy traders to know what's what, you need to tell them why this guy in 2017 earned 300%. Yeah, yeah. And whether it's relevant to what he's doing today. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it should go back further in time. Let's talk about your risk score. Is your risk score fair? Uh, I don't know. I I think it's all like pretty subjective. Your risk score. I say it every week, but at Copy Traders Club, we don't talk about average risk score. Risk score means max risk because the copier wants to know when their money was most at risk. And you seem to be a five and a four in, over the last 12 months. Four, four and a half, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. It's quite low and consistent. Max drawdown, 4.75%. Daily, 6.93 weekly, and 13.26 yearly. One more thing about long-term investing, that your drawdown is going to be quite high if you're not selling stuff. And then you get penalized in the filters because you filtered out a lot of stuff if your drawdown's high. Say that again? Like, if you're a long-term investor and you're just buying and holding, your drawdown's going to be high. Right. No. And then in the filters, when people search for you, a lot of the default filters is like max drawdown, 5% or whatever. But if you're just buying and holding, the drawdowns could quite easily be higher than that. So you get reward if you're more short term and trying to avoid drawdowns, you're kind of rewarded in the filters. Okay, so just explain why being a long-term investor makes it more likely that your drawdown is going to be higher. So if you if you buy and hold something, you've just got to ride the volatility and it could go down. I think when I bought Palo Alto Networks, it went down 30% at one point. So if I was a, if I just bought that and a few other companies and I was a long-term investor, it could have gone down a lot in the short term. But in the long term, I would have made money. But I would have been penalized by the filters because the drawdown would have been higher, even though over the long term, I would have made money. I recall seeing those stats about, I don't think it was 100 baggers. It may have been 100 baggers, but they talk about how in almost every circumstance you have to ride really heavy drawdowns at some stage. Yeah, yeah, exactly. In the journey of, of that investment. Yeah, you just got to ride it and ignore it. But if someone's got a short-term position on Itaru, you're saying, and they're very responsive to the market, they're in and out of positions, that keeps the drawdown lower. And then you appear in more filters. So although your gains might not be as big, you get featured more. Okay, copier numbers. Your current copier number as of the date of recording is 2,599. Assets under management, somewhere between 2 and 5 million. It's about 4 and a half. Okay, so looking at your copier graph, it's a pretty steady climb to the summit and then a slightly more gentle decline to where you're 
over half, I guess, of what your maximum copier number was. What was your maximum copier number like? Uh, I think it was 4.5. So give us an idea of why the drop-off. Well, I think the performance this year hasn't been as good as last year or any of the other years, really. Like when you're doing really well, people jump on board and this comment saying you're great and all this. And then as soon as you have like one bad month, people jump off and tell you, you know, what an idiot you are or whatever. Well, just looking through your stats here, uh, I don't see any full years that have negatives in front of them. Your first full year was 2017, 96%. 2018, 1.7%. 2019, 43%. 2020, 116%. And then 2021, compared to those numbers, is, as you say, a bit of a stinker so far at 3.9%. Has your investing style remained consistent throughout all that time? I think for 2017, I was investing in crypto a bit. And then I think... Since about June 2017, if I remember rightly, I just bought like 10 companies that I thought were good and then I just didn't look at it again for years, I think. I just pretty much, I wasn't really like a popular investor for most of that. I only started at the start of 2020. Start of 2020, became a popular investor. Yeah. That's when you put in your mega year of 116% almost. Yeah, yeah. What was that attributable to? Uh, Tesla, Shopify. It was just, I think, big tech generally did quite well. It did very well. Uh, yeah, it was just all the tech companies, trade desk, uh, everything really. But I, th- I think a lot of people did quite good that year. Didn't well, a lot of people did well, but there's degrees of, of good. Yeah, yeah, I suppose. <laughs> Let's talk about trades per week and average holding time. So it says four trades per week, average holding time, 9.5 months. So despite what we were talking about earlier about increasing activity beyond what you might normally do, those stats still very much tell the picture of a long-term investor. I tried to invest as if it was my own money. So I think if it was my own, I'd I'd hold everything for a long time. And yeah, I just invest it as if it was my own money. But then tried to communicate with copiers and that about why. Well, let's talk about your communication. How how do you feel you are as a communicator and what are your preferred avenues? I think I do okay. I definitely, last month when I was in Mexico, I probably should have written more. But I think I tried to do it every week, which is more than a lot of people, I think. And I've responded to comments, get yeah few emails and messages on telegram as well that i try to respond to but i think i do have an okay job yeah in the preparation for this chat we had a little bit of communication and you said something along the lines of i'm not the type to want to live my life in public yeah i don't really want like a youtube channel or to like i know there's some people that like post and do updates on kind of more personal stuff but I'm pretty happy to just keep it work. And then if people, there's sometimes people message me and ask me, uh, do you have any qualifications? What do you do? How did you learn about investing in that? And then I'm pretty happy to tell them if they ask me. But I just don't like giving, putting too much of my personal stuff online. Yeah, personal stuff isn't necessary. You don't have to tell them what you do at weekends. Yeah. yeah. Not everyone likes to reveal their dog's name, <laughs> things like that. Do you not think that uh, a level of access is kind of expected of a popular investor beyond the sort of what I would describe as the one picture PI, which is kind of the category you fall into? Yeah. Like I know what your picture looks like. And here we are chatting and we're connected by video link. And when you popped up, I thought, oh, that doesn't look. (laughs) <laughs> exactly, like Harry H's That's picture. That's a few years old, that photo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I should probably update it. So given the way eToro is currently, you can be the one pick PI who writes posts. 
But do you not think that the other PIs who are who are making weekly YouTube updates about their portfolio and just keeping their copiers informed about that stuff? Yeah. You don't think that's uh, you're missing a trick at all? Uh, possibly, but then I don't think so because I've looked at like the the copy people tab, and my decline is generally in line with other people's declines as well. <laughs> so I don't think it makes a massive. I think it's like one of those things where it's like privacy in Google or something where people say they care about it, but they're pretty willing to give up a lot of it. Whereas I think on I think on Itoro, people say they care about like the qualifications of the investor and the style and all that. But I think if your returns are good, people are going to copy you no matter what. Like I've, I've had three people contact me in the last year asking for more personal stuff, but I had like nearly 5,000 copies at one point. So I think a lot of people aren't that bothered about it as long as your returns are okay. And if you're answering questions and communicating and that sort of stuff, I think people are pretty willing to copy anyone. Yeah, maybe I'm exaggerating the importance of weekly updates or monthly updates on YouTube. Yeah, YouTube is probably better. Or well, YouTube's a better platform for providing updates, but I'm just I'm quite happy doing it on Eto. <laughs> and it's not really my thing. I'm not great in front of a camera or anything like that. Fair enough. Well, you do have a website which accompanies your uh your profile, Harry H, nineteen ninety three tech t e c h. Right. Although that could charitably be described as no frills. What? It's just not any more information compared to each other. Well, there's a bit more. I think there's an FAQ oh, is page, the... isn't there? Yeah, yeah. Ah, yeah. I suppose there is. I think it's a bit more. Yeah, but it's just provides oh, the basics. People want to copy me. Not a passion project, it's fair to say. Ah, no, no, no. It's just like a static website, pretty much. I just built it, and then it was more as a way of people, because you're not allowed to put links to Telegram and social networks on now. So, if people want to contact me, they can do it via the website. So they still have a way to contact me privately if they want. Yeah. So you think your communications on eToro are sufficient? G- yeah. Give us a flavour of what your communications are. Are they? Are they? general portfolio updates? Are they breaking down a, a, each position? Uh, I try and talk about, kind of give a summary of the news that week, like the economic news, the finance news, or whatever, and then talk about five companies in the portfolio that have had notable events happen to them in the week. I guess, given you've got a relatively long-term approach, you're not buying new things all the time, so you don't no. have a constant stream of here's another company that I've been looking into and here's here's my thesis. Yeah, yeah. I guess that's kind of another, not bad thing, but just thing about being a long-term investor is there's not always stuff to talk about. Like, like as well, if it was my own investments, I wouldn't be following the companies every week. But you kind of got to to provide updates and that. Dear listener, just a little pause here to say a few things directly to you. The calendar is full until the end of the year. That will mean 52 episodes, which seems like a good time to pause and call it season one and take stock. It's been a lot of fun and a lot of time and effort, but I'm pleased to be creating something of value for eToro users, particularly copy traders. Whether there will be a season two depends on a number of factors. I say it elsewhere, but I want to repeat it again here to really encourage a little action from you. If you want to see the podcast continue, you can help by bringing more listeners in. A lot of people still don't know about Copy Traders Club, so post about it on your PI's feed in eToro. Mention it on a Facebook group or in whatever Discord groups you're in. That's not too much of an ask, is it? On the podcast apps, there's always a share function that includes copy link. Use that. Or copy the YouTube channel link and share that. Or share a link to your favorite episode. 
there are many ways to eat an orange. I also have one of those affiliate links for new eToro signups in every episode's show notes. So, if you know someone interested in signing up, please copy and send them that link and help support the show that way. Now, I know these calls to action that you hear on podcasts can easily be ignored, and I always ignore them myself. Let's be honest. But this time, I am asking you, as someone who listens to and enjoys this one-person independent podcast, to make a little effort to help it along. You can even press pause and take two minutes to do it right now. If you do, know that I am grateful. If you don't, every time you hear this bit, you will be overcome with a crippling sense of guilt and unworthiness. Until you do. Back to the show. Now it's time to turn our attention to your portfolio in a bit more detail, Harry. So let's have a look at that. Allocation, so it's easy for the listener to picture. Stocks, 94%. ETFs, 6%. So that's pretty straightforward. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about what's hurting your portfolio right now. We mentioned earlier that this year has been a bit of an anus horribilis for Prince Harry. Still up, though. Could be worse. Well, China, obviously, is a problem at the moment. Various Hong Kong listings, Alibaba, Tencent, JD.com, and Xiaomi. Xiaomi the money. (laughs) Well, it isn't showing you the money at the moment. It's down a little bit. And the other ones are all significantly down. Yeah, it's mainly Tencent and Alibaba. What else have we got? HMMJ has come down off its highs. That's the Horizons Marijuana Life Sciences Index ETF. Yeah, yeah, it's not doing great. Then there's SoFi. Yeah, that's doing very bad. Which we'll talk about shortly. So China, Marijuana, SoFi, and the ARC Genomic ETF, all these things are currently weighing you down. Do these tell the story of your 2021 so far? Yeah, pretty much, I think. It's been, I've had a few good things, but then it's been pulled down by China. And, but I think a lot of popular investors and just investors in general are being pulled down by China at the moment. It seems to keep going on. I think Alibaba was down like 6% today again or something like that. Yeah, so what's your view on that? When do you think that the gloom is going to lift? don't know if it ever will or I think Tencent had their earnings report yesterday and they said they expect it to get more strict even though the company was doing really well but they just think this the regulations are going to get stricter because the government's going to want more control in the future as the country grows and it's the uncertainty of the future restrictions that's causing the problems but once the picture settles down a bit do you not think then yeah they should do good once it settles down but I don't know if that's six months two years when it will be okay so i want to ask you what your personal opinion is on the problems that you encountered purchasing sofi and your problems that that led to with copiers i ah, yeah, so because sofi went public through a spec like special purpose acquisition company uh, popular, a popular investor buys it. It doesn't get added to the copiers' portfolios, even if they're copying the investor. So that happened, to you? Yeah, yeah. But they, they, I think they sent out an email about six or eight months ago, saying it. But then I pretty much just forgot and then bought it. And did it cause a bit of a kerfuffle? No, I think most people didn't even notice. <laughs> I had a few copies say what's going on, but but at the time I didn't even know what had happened because I can't remember from sending the email. And that's true of all SPACs. All SPACs will not be copied into copier portfolios if a PI purchases them. Yeah. None of them. 
I think it was when eToro went public, they introduced that rule more or less around the same time. Is that just a guarantee that PIs and copiers weren't going to purchase FTCV? I'm not sh- I assume they did. Maybe they did it because SPACs are seen as more risky and they didn't want the risky positions to be copied into copiers' portfolios. But I'm not sure why. Or maybe there was some regulation because eToro went public through a SPAC. I'm not sure. But it'd be good. They should put like a notice on this company or something. Before you purchase it. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's uh, 36% down at the moment. So probably quite a blessing in disguise for your copiers. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I suppose. Yeah, if I'd have known, I wouldn't have bought it. And then I would have saved myself some $500 or whatever that is. Well, tell us about another investment that you wish you hadn't bought in the form of your worst ever investment. Uh, so far is my worst ever. Oh, that was easy. <laughs> yeah. By quite a lot, I think. In terms of how much it's gone down so quickly or? Yeah, just in terms of a lot. Uh, yeah, how much it's gone down. It's like nearly 40% down. And you don't see any hope in that? No, I think it'll do quite well over like five years. But Well, that's not what people want to hear. People want to hear sometime when you made a complete balls up and lost loads of money on something and the story is over. It's in history. I don't think I've ever done that. <laughs> is that because you're a long-term investor so you don't have a long litany of closed positions? Probably. And I think I've just never... I don't think I've bought anything that's gone down loads. Well, I've bought it when it's gone down loads. But I haven't closed the position when it went down. I think Air China, I bought when it was at six, and I closed it when it was at five. So that is that like sixteen percent or something? But that was because of the COVID crisis. I think that was my other worst one. That was the worst one that I've actually closed out. Air China. With six, yeah. But that was yeah, that was the start of COVID, and I kind of forced to sell it because of the risk score. So no obvious disaster springs to mind in a position that you've opened, it's gone down terribly, and you've exited. Okay, fair enough. Then you've got free reign to tell us about your best investment. Uh, I think Shopify was my best investment. That was the one I had to close. It was at 1,100%, and I had to close it because I found out that you have the invested value difference in the portfolios of the copiers. So I had to close it and rebuy it. But it was a, I think, yeah, I was up 1100% when I bought it. That's my best one. Tesla as well, I think. I've done quite well. Bitcoin too. Do you have any idea on the numbers of your, what, what number did you say on Shopify? 1100? Yeah, 1100%. 1100%. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty tasty. I had to sell it again because of the risk score, but if I'd held it longer, I could have made even more. But I bought it outside of eToro. Okay, so let's just have a quick look at your top positions in your portfolio to get an idea. You hold 25 positions with uh, Alibaba in Hong Kong as your top in terms of allocation, 4.86%. And then your allocations run down in small incremental declines to about 3% just under 3%. So you're not one of these PIs with high conviction bets and then a whole series of small ones. It's quite evenly spread. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it used to be more high conviction and then uh, in April I changed it a bit to kind of spread it out more. And you currently have about 11.5% cash balance. Is that the norm? Yeah, I try to keep it between 8 and 15, say. And other than the Chinese names that we mentioned earlier, let me just uh, run down the list here and mention what you've got. In terms of invested amount, second position is Amazon, third is Apple, fifth is ASML, then JD Weatherspoon, DR Horton Inc., Tesla, Etsy. Etsy's one I wanted to talk about. A bear might say, Like a lot of e-commerce companies that benefited from the pandemic, forward guidance is pretty underwhelming. This may affect Etsy more since a lot of their growth was 
face masks, custom face masks. So revenue growth is good, but it's not currently the massive growth story that it was in 2020. No. Growth is definitely decelerating. And the bear might say it will go down in history as one of those lockdown lunacy stocks that Mr. Market got a little too excited about. Would such a bear give you pause? Uh, no, not really. I think like you'd expect it. Like after, obviously, e-commerce boomed in 2020, and it was never going to grow as much in 2021 as it did last year. So I think it's normal that there's like a decline. I think Amazon saw it as well. A few other e-commerce companies saw the decline, but it's not really. It's a short-term like problem, but I think long-term it's still a good company. I think it's made some good acquisitions recently, so I think there's plenty more room for growth. So you own Alibaba in Hong Kong. Are you concerned at all about the VIE, ADR concern? Uh, that's what I initially had the ADR in America, but when they were talking about delisting it, I figured it was just the same to buy it in Hong Kong, really. And they were just not going to get delisted from Hong Kong, hopefully. But I just thought there was less chance of it get. If I had the ADR one, if you can have like the ADR one or the Hong Kong one, they're pretty much equal, the company. It's just the Hong Kong one isn't going to get delisted. Or it's less likely to get delisted. So often when I'm talking to PIs, they're on the rise or they're doing really well and this is a good opportunity for them to sell themselves. You're a PI who's had a great record in years gone by, but you're, as we discussed, in a bit of a dip at the moment. Does that mean it's a good time to copy you, to buy the dip in Harry H? <laughs> Could be, but then again, I think these questions are always, it's difficult to give an answer because like, of course, I should say it's a good time to buy the dip, copy me, my performance will be great. But I really, I don't think I can say that knowing that my performance might not be great. <laughs> so I don't really want to say, or like, I feel like I'm putting pressure on people to copy me when, like, I know my performance might not be as good as it was in the past. So it's kind of difficult to give an answer, I think. <laughs> okay, well, maybe it's easier to answer the standard question that I pose, which is, who should copy you? If you're a long-term cop, you want to copy someone for the long term that's had good results in the past, you copy me. But I can't guarantee that the results will be the same in the future. But it's kind of weird in a, in a way. Sure, no, nobody yeah, can. In a way, you're saying like you're not really saying anything by saying that because, of course, no one knows what the results are going to be in the future. But then I think even just by saying it, people sometimes are less inclined to copy you. <laughs> Just because you, you've admitted that they might not be great. When really everyone knows that. Well, I mean, I think people also like humility and a degree of honesty. Yeah, that's honesty. Well, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. That's very important from your PI. Yeah. I'd rather the guy who says, I can't guarantee what the future holds than I'm going to be the number one PI in eToro within a year. Well, your record shows that you're capable of very healthy returns. Yeah, yeah. And you're looking for people who share the similar long-term mindset. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But I guess there's a part of you that accepts that until the performance starts to tick up a bit more, it's going to be difficult to pull them in in any significant numbers. Yeah. And as well, I think my one-year returns are still over 100%, so I get filtered out with a lot of stuff still. That's funny. You're... One year returns over a hundred percent, but then your twenty twenty one returns look like slim pickings. My twelve month returns are like forty percent, but my one year returns are one hundred and thirty. But I don't know what the difference between twelve months and one year is. I mean, in the filters, mm -hmm. there's an option to set it to it. It's by default it's set to one year, so it shows as one hundred and thirty percent. But then if you change the tw the one year to twelve months, it comes up as forty percent. Well, I'm not a mathematician, but to my mind, those are the same. Yeah, that's what I mean, but I don't know. But then you have filtered out of a lot of stuff because by default it's set to one year. And it only shows 0 to 95%, I think. What role should you play as a PI in a copier portfolio? And can you describe that ideal portfolio with you in it? 
depends on the person, obviously, and what they want their strategy to be, but I'd have it set up with like four to six PIs, say, and then have one long term, one short term, which is probably quite, kind of difficult to find, or maybe two long term, two short term. And then I guess you could have me as one of the long-term ones, if you wanted. Don't feel pressured into it. <laughs> Jesus. That's hilarious. <laughs> and you have a very different approach from some of these other PIs. <laughs> it's like, well, if, it's up, if you want, I mean, I don't I know what's going to happen. I just don't want to pressure people into it. And then, <laughs> Well, it's refreshing to hear someone who's not making promises that they can't keep, because a lot of people will do that. A lot of people will say, this is a great time to copy me for the rest of the year. There's great things ahead. I'm very confident about that. So now is the time. So I don't see how you can say you're going to outperform it. Like on each other, like you might do. But I don't think you can say that for certain or make promises or anything like that, when knowing that most people won't. What would be your top change to make on eToro, if you could? Yeah, I think I'd change it so if a PI wants to add funds, they'd have to do it on the first day of the month so it doesn't affect their stats, which I think would solve that problem. It seems like kind of a big one. I think that would be the main change I'd make. The risk score, I think a lot of people... I've heard some people say it's, they think it's good, some people think it's bad, but... So I think whatever you do with that, you're going to upset some people. But I'd like, personally, I'd change it, I think. <laughs> or just make it. But then it's difficult to do as well, because how do you measure risk? I think volatility is an easy way to do it, but maybe not as accurate. Well, that's kind of what the risk score is. Yeah. A measure of volatility. Yeah. Because risk itself is, well, as Howard Marks would say, unmachinable. What does that mean? Unmachine, uncalculable. Well, apply, yes. You can't really reduce it to a mathematical formula. Yeah, that's a different. I think it's changes you could make, but I think they're kind of. It's always. I think it'd be super difficult to make one that applies to everyone, and that can kind of be standardized for everyone when you have so many different strategies and that. Yeah, as you say, no matter what is done, there's always going to be people who like it and people who don't. Yeah, yeah. Well, that exactly. ensures there's always plenty to talk about. Can't please everyone. More content for Copy Traders Club. <laughs> <laughs> what other PI would say you know the best on a personal level? Uh, I've never met any of them, to be honest. I only started doing it in 2020, right at the start of the pandemic, so there wasn't really much opportunity for meeting people. Uh, but I spoke to quite a few of them on Telegram and helped them out. They helped me out. Do you ever partake in video calls with PIs? Nah, no. Just text groups? Never did, no. Yeah, yeah. But even that, I used to be more active in it when it had like, the PI Telegram group had like 100 people in it, and there was a few of us that would always talk in it. And now I think it's 600, and it's just And who were those lot of people and... that would always talk about it? Uh, there's a guy called Meldo. His username is Meldo. I used to talk to him quite a bit. Fella called about trading. He's helped me out quite a lot. Are they still around? Yeah, yeah. And there was a guy called Adrian Padurian or something like that that was quite helpful. So none of the big uh, names. You're not best buddies with no, Wesley no. or oh, something. Oh, uh, I've spoke to Wesley a bit as well oh. on the app. He's always very helpful as well. Funnily enough. But yeah, I don't really know any of them but in person. And do you look forward to the day when the pandemic is over and there can be events in London where you all get together for PIMS and canapes and Canary Wharf? Yeah, yeah, it'd be nice to meet some others. That's not really my style, but yeah, meeting up would be cool. It's too formal, the PIMS. And... Would you rather a pint of cider in the pub by the Thames? Yeah, that'd be better. <laughs> Okay, final question. If you were in my shoes, what question would you like to have asked yourself that I didn't? I think I uh, could have asked where the investing style came from, what influenced you more, something like that. So where did the investing style come from? 
What influenced you? It was mainly watching videos, reading books. <laughs> it's just initially when I first started, I was buying crypto when I was in and out of it all the time. And I did quite good, but uh, I think I started watching more. I became more interested in investing and started reading more books by Peter Lynch and Warren Buffett and those sorts of people and watching videos as well. I think the Warren Buffett videos on YouTube are really good, like to start out with and super interesting as well. Uh, I'll just watch more of them and then realize like, Short term isn't really the way to go, or it doesn't seem to be. Uh, well, I think long term value investing is, or appears to be, the most accessible to people. You can get your head around why yeah, yeah. that would be an easier way of making money than trying to bounce around in a short term way. And yeah, I think a lot of people like know that long term is the right way to go, but it's difficult to do when it goes like now. It's easy to say. If it goes down 10%, I'll hold it. But when it goes down like 20, 30, 40%, a lot of people will sell it. Don't get scared. Like I lost 40% last year in one month when COVID hit. <laughs> but then over the whole year, I was up 115%. So. so tell us some of your formative books then, Rule One and things like that. Yeah, I haven't read that. But I the psychology of money one that I mentioned, Charlie Munger on, if you type in Charlie Munger books, he has a website where he has, I think, four or five books by him that are really good, but they're quite expensive. Uh, Peter Lynch's book, like One Up on Wall Street and all those, very good, I think. And then I like reading uh, biographies and autobiographies of different investors, like Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, Peter Lynch. And do you physically read or audio book it? No, I read it. I've got a Kindle. Oh, the ones on Charlie Munger's website you have to buy like physically. They're not available on Kindle, I don't think. But uh, everything else I read on Kindle mostly. It's cheaper and easier. Especially when I was traveling, it's a lot easier to read in Kindle than. Well, it's a lot easier to listen to an audio book than read on Kindle. They're expensive, they want. Or more expensive than reading it. Plus, I listen to a lot of podcasts, so it's kind of. Like, I can read physically and listen to podcasts. Whereas I was listening to everything, it, I don't know, just a different way of learning it, isn't it? Well, we've learned a lot about you today, Harry. Have you? <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> Thank you very much for dropping by the Copy Traders Clubhouse, and I'm sure everyone will be keeping an eye on your stats to see if you rise again like a phoenix from the ashes. Uh, hopefully I will. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. That was Harry H, 1993. Not exactly going for the hard sell and trying to attract copiers right now, but I would not be surprised if his results began to turn around and perform well for the next few years accompanied by a significant uptick in copiers. He has a proven pedigree and could be a lot better bet than some of these Johnny-come-lately salespeople that lurk in the muddy pool of PL. That's all from me. You can continue the conversation on Discord and Facebook. If you like this podcast and want to see it continue, you can do your part by recommending it to one person or group of people this week. Until next time we meet at Copy Traders Club, I wish you many happy returns. Obviously anything here in this podcast is for entertainment only, not financial advice. Do your own research. This is just generic chit-chat. We don't know your individual circumstances, etc., etc., and so forth. <laughs>